Amen, amen. Would you all remain standing with me as we get into the Word of God this Easter service? And as we get into this message, Easter is a joyous time for all of us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But to be honest, for every pastor, especially every pastor I know, this is like one of the hardest times because we have to preach on a story that all of us are familiar with. So as I prayed and read through the story, I saw Luke chapter 24, verse 36. And this is what the Word of God says in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. While they were telling these things, He Himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why does doubt arise in your hearts? See my hands, see my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of the joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And look at verse 45. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. Notice what He said there. It is written verse 46, that Christ would suffer, He would rise again from the dead on the third day. And in verse 47, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And I want to speak to you this Easter Sunday on the topic of this. It is written. That's what Jesus said to them. It is written that Christ would have to suffer. He would rise again for the repentance and forgiveness of our sins. Can we just praise God for that this morning? For the repentance and the forgiveness of our sins. Let us go to the Word in prayer. Father, we thank You for this Easter Sunday. And we thank You, Lord Jesus, that You suffered on the cross for our sins. And it's through You, Jesus, and only through You, Lord, that we have forgiveness, that we're able to repent and turn our lives to You, Lord. We thank You that in You, Jesus, we can walk this earth with confidence knowing that not only has our sins be forgiven, but we have been saved through You, Lord. And as we take this time to remember that suffering and that resurrection on this day, I pray that all of us would know without a doubt that we stand with confidence knowing our sins have been forgiven and we are born again. Help me preach this word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You guys can have a seat. As we get into this Easter service, I started reading Luke chapter 24, verse 36. And I started looking through all the Easter story. And I realized that that first Easter Sunday, that Jesus had risen. And this should have been a time of celebration. This should have been a time of joy for all of the Christians, for everyone that followed Jesus, especially for the disciples who followed Him for three years. This should have been the day they waited for with great expectation. But on that first Easter Sunday, you don't see the disciples celebrating. You don't see them overwhelmed with joy. In fact, you look at the disciples and you look at Mary and all the Marys and everyone else that follow Jesus and all of them are sad. All of them are discouraged. None of them have joy. They're confused. You see, because Friday, Jesus was crucified. 
And on that Friday, they nailed him to the cross. They pierced his hands. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They whipped him 39 times. They just abused on him and he suffered physically on that Friday. And on that Friday, he died. And with that death came the hopelessness for those disciples and all of those who followed Jesus. You see, when the disciples chose to follow Jesus, they followed him with great hope and expectation. But at that Friday, all of that hope was gone. All of that expectation was over. In fact, the disciples stood there confused. Did they waste their lives following Jesus for three years? Did they give up everything for nothing? Did Jesus mislead them? And they had no idea what was next. Everyone wanted them dead. Everyone wanted them arrested. So now they sat there in this room hiding, afraid, discouraged, hopeless, confused, not knowing what was going to happen next. You see, that Friday was all about suffering. And Jesus Christ would suffer on that cross, not only physically. We know that his hands were pierced with nails. His head was placed with crowns of thorns. We know that he was whipped. We know that he suffered physically. But Jesus would also suffer emotionally. Emotionally, Judas would betray him. The same Judas that was friends with him and followed him and loved him turned his back on Jesus and betrayed him. His own disciples scattered and his own Peter, his own Peter, his friend, denied him. So Jesus not only carried the physical pain of that Friday, but the emotional. Jesus would not only suffer physically, and emotionally, but Jesus would suffer mentally. The Bible says that Jesus would be on that garden right before his crucifixion, and he would tell his disciples he was in agony. He was in great distress because he knew that because of our sin would be laid on him, that God himself will turn his back on Jesus. And did you notice in that scripture that the disciples on that night, on that garden, they fell asleep, but Jesus could not sleep because of the mental distress he had. You see, Jesus suffered on that Friday. And a lot of you here this morning, you know a little too well what it means to suffer. And maybe in this church this morning, there's physical suffering. There's a disease in your body and weakness in your bones and you know what it is to suffer physically. Or maybe in this church this morning there's emotional suffering and there's been betrayal in your life. You have a Judas of your own and it should have been a spouse that stayed with you. It should have been kids that appreciated you more. It was a friend. It was a loved one you lost. But emotionally, you suffer that discouragement and that anger and that pain of betrayal. And not only in this church and in this world is there physical and emotional suffering. There's mental suffering as well. And like that night in the garden, Jesus could not sleep. And I wonder this morning in this church, how many of you stay up at night because mentally you're suffering? Mentally you're depressed. Mentally you're distressed. Mentally you're discouraged like Jesus was that night and losing sleep. You see, a lot of us here know what it is to suffer. And some of you have suffered greatly. And I want you to know that if you are one of those people suffering, Jesus knows what you're going through. Even Jesus on the cross on that Friday, he asked Jesus himself, asked God, why have you forsaken me? See, even Jesus asked God, why? Isn't that the question we ask when life is unfair? 
Isn't that the question we ask when life doesn't go our way? Is that not the question we ask God when you're going through suffering beyond belief? You're asking God why? But I'm going to tell you that on that Friday, when Jesus was on that cross suffering and he asked God why, God said nothing because Jesus would go through a period of silence where he would not hear his father speak. And maybe you're going through a season of suffering and you're going through a season where it seems like God is silent. And on that moment, on that Easter weekend, on that Friday, it all looked hopeless for everyone. For those disciples and all of the followers of Jesus Christ, it looked like it was over. Have you ever been in a place in your life where it seems like it's over? And on that weekend, it looked like the devil had won. And all of the enemies that Jesus had, they laughed in victory. We got them. And on that weekend, it looked like the ministry had failed. And on that Easter weekend, it looked like the disciples had wasted their time. And as they hid in that room in fear, and as they hid in that Easter weekend, in that room with discouragement and overwhelmed because of what happened Friday, but Sunday was coming. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell him Sunday is coming. Because even though it looked like the devil had won, Sunday was coming. And even though it seemed like the enemies were laughing and had victory, Sunday was coming. And even though it seemed like everything was falling apart, Sunday was coming. And even though he went through betrayal, Sunday was coming. And even though he asked God why, Sunday was coming. And even though it seemed like God was silent, Sunday was coming. And on this day, we celebrate that Sunday came, that he rose again. That God has the last word. And I want to tell someone here this Easter morning, you may seem like life is falling apart. You may be depressed beyond belief, going through physical and emotional and mental and spiritual suffering. You might just be going through a Friday. You might be going through the silence of Saturday. But in Jesus' name, Sunday is coming. So don't you give up. God has a plan. He's in control. You're just going through a Friday. Sunday is coming. And on this day, we celebrate that Sunday that he rose. Look at verse 36 with me. The disciples were in the room. Remember, they're afraid, they're discouraged. They have no joy. They're confused. They don't know what's next. And maybe that's how you feel right now. And while they were talking, he himself, that's Jesus, he himself stood in their midst. And he said to them, Peace be with you. The first thing Jesus said on that Easter to those followers is peace be with you. As they sat there confused and afraid and discouraged, wondering what's going to happen, what's next, and what if they catch us, and what if we die, what if we wasted our time, Jesus stood there in their midst and he said, peace be with you. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Peace is not the absence of trouble but the presence of Jesus Christ. 
And you might be going through a Friday or the silence of a Saturday. And even today on this Sunday, you are depressed and discouraged and sad and lonely and afraid and confused and the list goes on. But Jesus stands at our midst and He says, peace be with you. Is it possible that no matter what you're going through, you don't have to lose your peace? Is it possible, no matter what you're suffering, you don't have to give up your peace? No matter who betrayed you, you don't have to lose your peace. No matter how confused you might be, you don't have to lose your peace. I believe peace is something we don't lose. Peace is something you choose to give up. Because God says Himself, when I stand in your midst, you can have peace knowing I'm in control and I am God. And that's why we celebrate this Easter. Because even though it seemed like nothing was working out, Jesus rose again. He stood in the midst of His followers, His people, and He said, peace be with you. How many of you have peace today? How many of you have lost it? How many of you are searching for it? Peace is something that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And I want to preach to you this morning on the two types of peace only Jesus can give you. The first one is called the peace of God. Look with me in verse 45 through 46. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And He said to them, It is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again. I want you to hold that verse with me. Because they went through a season of suffering. And Jesus had to suffer. They couldn't understand why they suffered. They couldn't understand why Jesus had left. They couldn't understand why the ministry was failing. They couldn't understand why it seemed like everyone else that was against them was winning. They couldn't understand. But see, Jesus opened up their minds to understand something we need to understand today. Though the suffering was hard, maybe unfair and unpleasant and painful and discouraging, did you notice that in this scripture, Jesus told them it was written? You know what that tells us this morning? That everything that Jesus went through on that Easter week weekend was written before it even happened. It meant that before he even stepped foot on that cross, it was already written he would. And before he was even betrayed by Judas, it was already written he would. And before he was scattered by all of his disciples, it was already written that he would. Jesus let the disciples know, this suffering I went through had to happen. It was written. It was behind God's plan. God had a purpose for it. See, then we could have the peace of God in our lives because no matter what you might be suffering right now, nothing catches God off guard. Nothing surprises Him. It might be of surprise to you whatever it is you're going through. But everything you've gone through, everything you're going through, and everything you will go through has been written and predestined, and God already knows, and nothing surprises Him. And even though the disciples couldn't understand it, and even though it seemed like it was unfair, when Jesus opened up their minds to understand, and He said, it is written, He was letting us know all of this was always in God's control. 
Hebrews 12, 2 tells us this. To fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now I want you to notice what this verse says. It says we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. But did you notice that the Bible calls him the author and perfecter? Church, what does an author do? He writes. And that word perfecter literally means finisher. Here's something crazy about God. He's not writing your story as we speak. God is not in heaven saying, I wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. And then He's going to write about it. He doesn't journal. He keeps no diary. The Bible says that Jesus is the author. He has written every day of your life. Nothing you do has caught Jesus off guard. No sin you've committed has surprised Him. No past that you have has caught Him completely off, completely off His attention. He has written every day of your life. Just like He told the disciples, it was written. Psalm chapter 139, verse 16. It tells us this, because some of you might be here today and say, do I have a purpose? Does God have a plan for my life? Does God know what I'm going through? Does God even care? The Bible says, you saw me before I was born. Before we were born, God saw you. And that doesn't mean that he saw you like a little fetus or a little ember, whatever. No, the fact that he says, I saw you, he means I saw all of you. I saw the day you were born. I saw the day you would die. I saw the mistakes you would make. I saw the great choices you would make. I saw everything you would do. I saw everything you don't do, you wouldn't do. I saw who you would marry. I saw who you would divorce. I saw who you would cheat on. I saw the kids you would have. I saw the job you would have. I saw you retiring. I saw you dying sooner than you thought. I saw this. I saw that. The Bible says you saw me before I was born. If you want to know whether God knows you, there it is. He knows everything about you. I saw you before you were born. Every day of my life was recorded. It was written in your book. Every day of our lives was written by God, meaning God has a plan and a purpose for every day of your life. No matter what you've done, God already knew you would do it and already had a way to work it for His good and His glory. And the Bible says every moment was laid out before a single day has passed. You might think you're living day by day, but God has your entire life laid out. And that's why we could have the peace of God. Because if anything Easter tells us is that even though there was a lot of heartache and lying and betrayal, and even though there was a lot of suffering, it was written. God already knew. God already had a way. God already had a plan. God already saw it coming. It was all laid out. We can have peace the peace of God. Knowing that every day of our lives has been written. That's why Jesus asked the disciples directly, why are you troubled? Why do you have doubt? 
See, it doesn't make sense to serve a God that knows everything before it happens and lays out everything in our life and He knows everything before it even takes place and already has a plan and He's written our story. It makes no sense for all of us to live our life here on earth with fear. It makes no sense to live with doubt. It makes no sense to let things in this world trouble us. But sadly, so many people are troubled today. You're troubled about what's happening in the news. You have what's happening in our country. You're troubled by gas prices. You're troubled by war. You're troubled by this family member. You're troubled by this child. You're troubled by your money problems. You're troubled by work. And God says, why are you troubled? It was written. Why do you doubt? See, sometimes you can get so troubled in life. Like the disciples were on that Easter. They were so troubled that it caused doubt. What if we wasted our time? What if he wasn't a savior? What if they catch us? What if we go to jail? Well, what if we die? I doubt we're going to make it. I doubt we're going to survive this. What's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to us? And the disciples were filled with doubt. And maybe that's you this morning. And life is just troubling you. And robbing you of your peace. Because it is impossible to have the peace of God when you allow the troubles in this life to cause doubt in your minds. And Philippians 4, 6-7 says this. And this is a verse we all need this morning. Amen? Be anxious for nothing. That word anxious literally means worry. How many of you worry a little too much? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God. Say that with me. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds. Because that's where doubt and anxiety attacks. Your heart is talking about your emotions. Your mind is talking about your thoughts. You want to know why you're so worried? Let me know today what you're thinking about. And that's why you're feeling the way you're feeling. That's why you're losing sleep. That's why you're always afraid. That's why you're popping pills. That's why you got to get drunk and forget. That's why you don't sleep at night. That's why you're worried and afraid all the time. That's why you're losing hair. That's why you're losing weight. That's why you're gaining weight. Why? Because you're filled with constant worry. And what if? And doubt. And I doubt it. And you're just like the disciples. But Jesus stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Why is it that we could have the peace of God? Because every day of our lives has been written and pre-planned. And He knows the beginning from the end. And I promise you as I stand here today in this pulpit, God is in control. That is the story of Easter. You may not understand it. It may seem unfair, but we can have the peace of God. That makes no sense, the Bible says. Because you know it is written. The peace of God is a peace knowing that I don't have to understand. My trouble doesn't have to end. I can have peace right now knowing like that Easter service Pastor David preached, it 
is written. And God says, that thing you're going through right now, I saw that before you were born. That cancer in your body, I knew was there before you were even born. That loss in your family, I knew before you were even born. Everything of your life has been laid out before God. That's how much in control He's in right now. Can we just give God some praise for that? Come on. Can we all just for a moment, can, just, just, just for the sake of Easter, can we take a deep breath and turn to your neighbor and say, hey, relax, and tell him it's been written. It's been written. Let's talk about another peace that only Jesus can bring. First, Jesus can bring us peace, the peace of God. And the peace of God deals with our physical circumstances on earth. The problems we go through every day. You can live with peace knowing God is in control. But the other peace only Jesus can bring, not, it doesn't deal with this life here on earth, but it deals with the eternity, with life after we die. That's called the peace with God. That's the only two pieces that the Bible speaks of. The peace of God deals with my problems, physical problems on earth, that God is in control of. But the peace with God, well, that deals with your heart and eternity. Look at verse 46 to 47. Notice Jesus said, talked about the suffering. And he said to them, it is written, meaning I had it planned. We already talked about that. That Christ would suffer. He would rise again, which we're celebrating this Easter, from the dead on the third day. But why? For the repentance, for the forgiveness of sin. So that repentance for our sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. That means everyone and anyone beginning from Jerusalem. The purpose of Easter is not just to show us that God is in control of our physical circumstances in life. But the purpose of Easter is also for us to recognize that on this day, Jesus did not only die on Friday, but rose again on Sunday so that we could have our sins forgiven and have the opportunity to repent and turn our lives to Jesus. And here's the truth. That word sin that the Bible talks about on this verse for the forgiveness of our sins. You guys see that word sin there? You guys see it? All right. That word sin literally means to miss the mark or miss the target. So, Pastor, what does that even mean? That word sin means to miss the standard of God. See, there is a standard that God requires from all of us. And that is that we be perfect and sinless. How many perfect and sinless people do I have in this church today? I have one liar there. So you're, you're disqualified. You're a sinner. Again, how many of you are perfect? You might think, I'm close, but it means you're still not. God's standard for us is perfection. His standard for us is to be sinless. And you might be saying, well, pastor, wait a minute. That is impossible. And if you want proof that we're all sinners, look at my spouse. None of us can fulfill that standard. Do you understand why Jesus had to come and die for our sins? Because Jesus did what we could not do. He came to this earth and lived 
a sinless, perfect life. In fact, Romans 3, 23 through 24 says this. All of us, for all, have missed the mark. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Notice the Bible first says, all of us have sinned and we have missed the standard of God. But notice being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to read that whole verse in, its, in the whole entirety. Look at Romans 3.23 with me. All of us have sinned. Say that with me. All of us have sinned. Can we say amen to that? Can we agree? Amen. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now look at verse 24. But being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. See, the Bible is clear that all of us have sinned. And because we have sinned, we became enemies of God. But Jesus came to this earth and he lived a perfect sinless life. And he came to die on the cross for our sins, for you and for mine. And Jesus did what we could not do. And the Bible says that this is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. Why does the Bible call it a gift? Because a gift is something that is given. It is not something you deserve. None of us deserve forgiveness. None of us deserve salvation. Not even me. I'm here preaching. That doesn't mean anything. We're all in church. That means nothing. Why? Because all of us have sinned. All of us have missed the standard of God. But the Bible says, and this is what we remember on Easter, that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a sinless, perfect life for 33 years, and He died on the cross for you and for me. And it's a gift. You do nothing to earn it. Let me illustrate this for you. But many, many years ago, my family and I went to a fair. Mom, do you remember in my room a cow with a cowboy hat that I had? That was my favorite toy growing up. It was a giant stuffed animal. And I slept with that bull. He was a cool guy. Let me describe. He had a bull horns, cowboy hat, and a revolver. And I thought that was the coolest boy ever. So I, my parents gave us each $5. And we can spend it however we want. And when your pastor saw that bull, I said, there it is. So I slapped down the five. Back in the day, $1 got you 10 ping pong balls. I slapped down the five. You do the math. I was getting that bull. And when I got all my ping pongs, all I had to do, way far in the middle, was to hit it in this little cup. And there was your pastor. And I was running empty. And now I was getting afraid. I was getting frustrated. I said, this is impossible! And I kept trying and missing. See, all of us, that is like how we live our lives. God has a standard, and that's perfection. And no matter how much you try to be perfect, you'll always miss because all of us, oh, that was oh, still missed. All of us are sinners. And let me tell you, this is how we get with God. Yeah, God, but. Some of us are not as bad as others. Yes, yeah, some of them are closer to others. But guess what? Still missed. There I was, not hitting the standard. And this is how we get with God. We can't do it. 
And wouldn't you know, I ran out of ping pong balls. I never made it. This is an honest to God true story. When I was hopeless and mad at myself and thinking, man, I can't even make it, a ping pong ball flew and went. And there was a man, I'll never forget him, he was right next to me. And this man saw me trying. And I don't know how, maybe it was God doing this for this very sermon today. But this man on his first try nailed it. And when that crazy carny guy said, who made it? That man said, he did. And I said, I was a Christian already. I said, no, I didn't. And he said, do you want it? I said, yeah. And he said, then you made it. And I said, okay. And I got my bull. And I walked up. Danny was bitter. He's like, you didn't win. I'm like, yes, I did. You remember, Danny, how jealous you were? All right. And I, I slept with that bull. I hung him on my wall. I had him for years. Once I got married, I had to give him up. But listen, I had that bull, but I walked with confidence. Like, I want it, even though I know I didn't. But see, that's what salvation is. All of us have missed it. But Jesus did what we could not do. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And all he can say is, do you want it? Do you want it? See, suppose though I said, you know, no, no, I don't want it. I'm going to keep trying. And this is what we do. Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. But so many people say, no, no, no. I, I got to try and work for it. I got to go to church more. I got to be nicer. But here's the thing. Perfection is impossible. And that's why Jesus had to come to die. It makes no sense for anyone to think that it is by works or good works that you're saved. Because all the good works doesn't stop the fact that we're all sinners. And even though, can you imagine if I said, no, 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 don't worry, I got this. You know what would have eventually happened? would have ran out of money. I couldn't do it. Church, I hope you get this this morning. All of us here are sinners. No matter how you want to paint it, all of us have missed the mark. You failed. And Jesus had to come to this earth to die for our sins. And all we can do is receive that and say thank you. Well, I'm not that much of a sinner. Really? Can we get real in church this morning? How many of you have ever told one lie? One. One lie? Okay, everyone else, raise your hand. You're lying right now. <laughs> what would that make you? Liar. All right. This is a crazy question. How many have ever murdered someone? All right, all right. Better yet. But see, Jesus said that if you've ever even talked bad about someone, you've committed murder. How many of you now, by Jesus' standard, have committed murder? Ever talk bad about someone? All right, guess what? Mmm, guys are sinners. How many of you have ever cheated on your spouse? Ooh. Not even you? All right. But Jesus said if you've ever even looked at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery. How many of you have even looked the other way? Mmm, look at her. Mm. Anyone? Lust, lustful? Lustful thoughts? Anyone? Don't be shy. Come on. Come on. 
Missed it. Ah, the other they're afraid. How many have ever stolen something? All right. Come on, where are my paper clip in the office, people? Stapler, pencil, that counts. Guess what? By your own admission, my church is filled with lying, adultery, stealing, murderers. Amen? Amen? Guess what? We're all sinners. But see, the, the beauty of all of this is that none of us can look at each other and say, oh, I didn't miss that much. No, we all sinned. We missed it. That's why Jesus did what we couldn't do. And He looks at you right now and He says, are you going to keep trying to get to heaven by being good? By, by working church? By praying this? or what? What do you, Because in the end of the day, look at that floor. We're sinners. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this. By grace, you've been saved. That word grace literally means love that you don't deserve. Do you know that the love that Jesus gave us on that cross, none of us deserved? That's why it's grace. We thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ because if it was the standard of God we had to live by, all of us would be damned to hell right now. That's why when I ask someone, hey, are you sure you're going to heaven when you die? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a good person. I'm like, uh-oh. None of us are good. By grace, you've been saved through faith, through faith, through, say it with me, through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ. The same way I put my faith in that man that did what I couldn't do, Jesus says, would you put your faith in me? It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of, say it with me, works. So that no one can boast. See, none of us can boast. Oh, I'm a good person. I go to church. I prayed this prayer. I light that candle. I, I wear this quad or whatever. I toss these shouts. I do this. I do that. I went to church. I gave money. I was a member of Forward. None of that means nothing. In fact, if you're saying, oh, I've done this, guess what you're doing? You're boasting. And the Bible says no one can boast because all of us have sinned. Do you get it now? The only thing you can boast in is Jesus Christ. The same way I walked that fair with that confidence, holding that bull, Jesus says you can live this life with confidence, knowing you're saved because you are boasting in what I did. And you have put your faith and trust in me. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. And the only way to get peace with God is by acknowledging, Lord, I've missed the mark. I'm a sinner. But I know you did what I couldn't do. You lived a sinless, perfect life, and it's in you, Jesus, I'm putting my trust. This is the craziest thing. Let me make it easy for you to understand. You have sinned. Amen? The Bible says you are in sin. All of us right now, you and I, are in sin. So can you imagine, remember the standard of God is perfection? 
That means if you die without Jesus Christ, you're going to be in the judgment seat of Christ still with your sin. And God cannot be in the presence of sin. And you're going to tell God, well, I went to Easter service with that good-looking pastor with his suit, and I preached, and I heard the sermon, and I prayed, and I gave that day. That day, that day I gave extra, pastor. I remember. And I did this, and I did that. And Jesus is going to say, you missed the mark. You still have sin. And if you die without Jesus Christ in your sin, you're going to have to pay for that. But see, here's what's interesting. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Ask a big question here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone, if, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, when you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and that you're a sinner and that He came to die for your sins, to do what you could not do, the Bible says you're in Christ. It doesn't stop the fact that you're a sinner. Christians aren't perfect. Christians are forgiven. And now you see that I'm in sin, but now I'm in Christ. So that when I die, and the Lord looks at me, He doesn't see me for my sin. That has been paid for by Jesus. He sees Jesus in me, who is perfect, and therefore I walk with confidence, knowing I'm forgiven, and Jesus is the only way to the Father, and I put my faith and trust in Him. It is not by my works, it is not by being good, but I put my trust in Jesus because I knew I was a sinner. And now when God sees me, He sees Jesus. And I thought about this this week with our sister Frankie who's with the Lord right now. And Frankie had a confidence about her because she knew where she was going. And Paulette, I promise you, the day Frankie closed her eyes and took her last breath, she stood in the presence of God. And when God looked at Frankie, he saw Jesus in her. And he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. People, it's just a gift. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. That's why Romans 5.1 says this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith only, faith that you're a sinner, faith that knowing nothing else can save you but Jesus, Faith knowing that Jesus is the only one who lived a sinless, perfect life and I'm going to get in Him. Not by my works. Not because I'm good. No, I've missed the mark. I might be the worst of the worst. But I know that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died for my sin. And I put my faith and trust in Him. And the Bible says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God is different than the peace of God. Remember, the peace of God is peace knowing that God is in control of the physical circumstances in this lifetime. But the peace with God is knowing that God in through Jesus, is in control of my sin in the next lifetime. And therefore, I now have peace with God. Because our sins made us enemies to God. But the second you put your faith in Jesus Christ, 
God said, we have peace. My wrath that was meant for you has been placed on Jesus. My question to you is today, are you going to say, no, 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 I'm going to keep trying to be good. I'm going to keep trying to earn my salvation. And God is saying, it's a gift. It's a gift. You can't go to church all you want. You're lost. Pray all you want. You're lost. I paid for it on the cross. You keep sinning. You're a sinner. You're not good. Everyone here this morning is going to make a choice for Jesus. And some of you are going to choose to stop playing this game with God and try to earn your salvation. And I hope I get there. And you can choose today to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. To have your sins forgiven. Because that's what Easter is all about. His purpose was to come to this earth to die for our sins because He did what we could not do. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And in Jesus, we meet the standard of perfection that God requires. But the choice is yours. Some of you will choose not to. And I don't know why in, the, in your right mind, why would you not choose to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who did what we could not do? And I pray that you guys would make that choice today. Because like that little boy that I was walking in that fair confident with my bull that I know I didn't deserve, I pray you can have that peace with God that enables you to live the rest of your life here on earth knowing you have confidence that when you die, you will be in the presence of Christ with Him in heaven, not because you went to some church, not because you went to heard in some sermon or you went to as many Easter services as you could, not because of what you did, because you've acknowledged that none of us are good. None of us. And that's clear. You see, Jesus asked the disciples, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? And I understand today, we have the peace of God. We have no reason to be troubled or doubt here on this earth because God has written everything. He's in control. So I can have the peace of God and not live with worry and anxiety. But let's talk about the peace with God. And maybe some of you doubt that this morning and it troubles you. Well, Pastor, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. Are you willing to put your life on the line with words like, I hope so? Or will you say today, I want to know without a doubt and you might be hearing the devil right now. Not you. Oh, not you. You are the worst of the worst. No, we're all the worst of the worst because look around you. All of us have missed it. All of us. No matter who you are. As Christians, God is not asking you to be perfect you can't. You could only be forgiven. Psalm 14.3 says this. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. If you're that person that thinks you're good enough for heaven, you are calling God a liar. Because God says clearly, no one is good. It's a gift from God. That is the story of Easter. What choice will you make? 
I'm glad I have the peace of God that knows He's written every day of my life. And I have the peace knowing I have no reason to be anxious or worried. God is in control. And I live with confidence knowing I have peace with God. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I pray and read the Bible, or go, no, or grew up in a Christian home. I have the peace with God because when I was 15 years old, I remember listening to a pastor preach what I'm preaching right now. And at that age, I recognized that I was a sinner, even though I had fantastic parents and grew up in a Christian home and I was privileged and, I was, and I, that was a blessing. But I knew I was a sinner. And on that day, I walked forward like you're about to hopefully to the altar I got on my knees and I just asked Jesus to forgive me and I asked the Lord and I said Lord I surrender to you I understand and I put my faith and trust in you and on that day my name was written on the book of life all of my sins past present and future were forgiven and I now walk with confidence knowing I have peace with God through Jesus and through nothing else We got to stop this. Well, don't all roads lead to heaven. No, the Bible says it is by faith through Jesus. That is it. Happy Easter, everyone. <laughs> now, close with this peace with God, peace of God. Let me join this together. The peace of God is knowing God has a plan for everything. He works everything for good. He's in control. And a few weeks ago, I went with a close friend and his son. I went fishing on this smaller boat that I have. And it was a beautiful Saturday morning. We were fishing. And I only went 15 minutes out to the ocean. 15 minutes, that's nothing. And all of a sudden, this huge wind came out of nowhere. And the waves picked up, and that little boat was not big enough to handle the waves that came. And your pastor was scared. And I said to myself, you know, I'm just going to head back and go 15 minutes back home, and we're good. But the waves were so strong that I had to go around the bay for four hours to make it home. And I was praying, I said, Lord, I don't know why I'm in this mess. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why, Lord, I'm about to get married. I don't know why I'm gonna miss my marriage. It was right before I got married, I remember that. But as I was just going along, something told me, look left. David, look left. Look left. When I looked left, I saw someone in the water doing this in the middle of the ocean. And I said to my friend, is, is that the person? And he looked and he said, I think so. And he was waving like he was about to go under. And I got my little boat and I said, I don't know if we're going to make it, but we have to save him. And I got my little boat and I was chucking along to get him. And as I got closer, there it was, a man. Here's a story that you won't forget. He was drowning. The current, he fell and the current was taking him offshore. And there was no boats around. And I realized the providence of God. I realized the reason that I could not go 15 minutes back this way is because God was working everything for me to go that way because someone needed to be saved. That's how God works. That's how you know it's all written. He knows everything and he's so in control that he would cause a wind to turn from nowhere to get your pastor out in the middle of the dangerous ocean to save someone from dying. And I wasn't ready for this. So what I did was I grabbed the life jacket and this very rope. 
And I don't know why I said this to him. But I said, hey, are you good? He must have looked at me like, what do you think? And he said, I'll never forget this, what he said. He said, I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm dying. And I don't want to die, he said. And there I was holding a lifeline. And the minute he said that, I just tossed it to him. He grabbed that life jacket like it was all he had left. And I pulled him safely onto my boat. And he said, I thought I was going to die. And he said, what are you doing out here anyway? And I said, aren't you glad I was? See, what if today you're dying in your sin? You're about to go under and eternity forever in hell. But Jesus stands there and he says, Hey, are you good? And you say, No, I'm not good. I'm a liar. I'm a murderer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a thief. I'm a sinner. I'm not good. Do you want me? Yes. Do you need me? Yes. Do you trust me? Yes. Here you go. Welcome to the kingdom of God. But suppose you're drowning and you said, I, I think I can make it. I hope I make it. But see, I did what that man could not do. I got him back to shore. And Jesus does what we cannot do. He died a perfect sinless life so that we would be saved through him and nothing else. When I brought that man back to the sandbar, he said, I asked him, what happened? He goes, I went for a swim. I got caught by this current. It came out of, this wind came out of nowhere. And I was just yelling and no one was listening. But I'm so glad you saw me. And this man was so grateful. Can I tell you, he was good looking, Australian, and that boat he fell off was his yacht. And I said, here's my church. Here. He was so grateful. He said, hey, can I do anything? Can I give you something? Why don't you come over, have dinner, let me get you a beer? And I said, no. You don't have to give me anything. I did it because I wanted to. There is nothing you can give Jesus. He needs nothing from you. He died on the cross for our sins because he wanted to. Because he loved you. And when you are born again and saved, all you can do is say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you. And maybe right now, in the providence of God, the wind has turned and you've landed in this church and you're hearing the gospel for the first time or for the first time in a long time or many times. But today, the Bible says, is a day of salvation. And I'm grateful that we have a God that says you don't have to be worried about anything on this life. You can have the peace of God, knowing He's in control of your circumstances. But let's talk about the peace with God. The peace that God can say to you, well done. You're forgiven. But the choice is yours. On Easter, we celebrate the fact that Jesus was always in control. 
But this Easter, we celebrate the fact that Jesus died and rose again to do what we could not do. And the Bible says, in Him, we are made right with God. So don't you leave this church and say, I didn't tell you so. It is not by works. Stop telling yourself, I'm good. You're not. Don't leave this church saying, I hope so. But like that man said, without a doubt, I am not good. And that guy didn't know me. But he trusted in me. The difference is Jesus does know you. He knows every sin you've ever committed. Your whole life it's written. It's all laid out. And even the worst of the worst, Jesus says, I still love you. I can still forgive you. You can still come to me for salvation. Can we all just pray this Easter? Let's all stand to our feet today. And I want to give you guys the opportunity today. Once and for all. To experience peace like you've never had. A peace that no one else can give but Jesus. A peace knowing that God has written every day of your life. That's why you can't tell me today, Pastor, I'm too much of a sinner. God can't forgive me. No, God already saw that sin before you were even born and He already died for it. And today is the day of salvation. You can leave this church this morning saying, I'm good. I'm fine. I hope I make it. Or you can leave here with the confidence knowing you have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Because on that Easter Sunday, as a pastor preached and called you to the altar, you once and for all stopped playing games with God. And you asked Him to forgive you of your sins. And on that day, a dirty, rotten sinner became saved in Jesus. So that when that person dies, the Lord does not see your sin anymore. But He sees His Son Jesus. Jesus, and you are made perfect in the eyes of God and you enter only through Jesus and only through Jesus do you enter into the kingdom of heaven so don't you leave here without knowing that you are saved so let me ask you this question this morning church Jesus asked them why are you troubled why do you doubt? And my question to you this morning, does the thought of eternity trouble you? Does the thought of dying trouble you? Because as Christians, we look at death as the greatest opportunity of our lives because we have the confidence we stand with Jesus Christ. But if the thought of death and eternity trouble you. And maybe you're saying, Pastor, I have doubts that I'm saved. Would you put that hand up for a moment and say, Pastor, I have doubt. I'm not sure. God bless you. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, today, the Lord sees you. And you may be dying in your sins right now. And the Lord will ask you, hey, are you good? My prayer is you say, no, Lord. I'm a sinner. I'm not good. I deserve to go to hell. Nothing I can do can stop the fact that I am a sinner. But I understand now, Lord, why you came. To die on the cross for my sins. Because I missed the mark. But I know you, Jesus, did not. And you did what I can't. You lived the perfect life. And I know I don't deserve it. I know I can't earn it. But I know it's a gift. And today, 
I received that gift of salvation and I asked you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. And I put my faith and my trust acknowledging you, Jesus, as Lord. And if that's you this morning, I invite you this morning to put that hand up so I can pray with you this greatest opportunity of your life. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you there. God bless you. I see you there. I see you all there. And all of you who raised your hands today, I invite you to pray this with me. If you understand now the words that were preached this morning, you say, Lord Jesus, I understand. Lord, I'm not good. I am a sinner. Just tell him right now for what it is. You're a sinner. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And today I desire to have peace with you. Lord, I ask you, Lord, today to forgive me of my sins as I put my faith and my trust in you, Jesus, and no one or nothing else. And today I receive the gift of salvation through your death on that cross. And I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Forgive me, Lord, and welcome me into your kingdom when the day comes. In Jesus' name. Welcome to the family of God. Come on, give God some praise today. And I want to pray for all of us here today before we dismiss in a special Easter service. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm born again. I know without a doubt I have that confidence like you did with that bull in your hands. I have confidence with Jesus that I'm good with God only through Jesus. But like those disciples, they were believers too. They put their faith and trust in Jesus, but they were in this room, afraid, discouraged, anxious, worried, sad, and depressed. And you know what all that tells me? It's just because you're saved doesn't mean you're not human, amen? Maybe right now you're going through a hard time. And you're going through a season where God is silent. You don't know what's going to happen, but you want to pray that the Lord gives you right now the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And I'm here to tell you, Easter, the first Easter was not a pretty one. It was full of chaos, trouble, and fear. But remember, Sunday was coming. So I want to encourage anyone here this morning, if this is you and you're saying, Pastor, I'm in the Friday, I'm in the Saturday, and help me to endure and wait for the Sunday. I'm afraid, I'm discouraged, I'm going through a lot, and I need the Lord to give me His peace. And I promise you this, His peace surpasses all understanding. The Lord knows what you're going through. He knows what you're up against. And he has a plan in the way. So you trust him like you did when you trusted him with your soul. If that's you this morning. Would you put your hand up? I want to pray over your life. God bless you. You there. You all around the room today. Let's all pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, in no other name. We love you. We trust you. But we're scared, discouraged, afraid, not knowing what's going to happen. And in this room today, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's guilt. And in this room, there's just confusion, Lord, because life is hard. But on that day, you stood among the disciples and you asked, why are you troubled and why do you doubt? And forgive us, Lord, for allowing the troubles of our lives to cause doubt in us. You are God Almighty. You are Lord and you are in control. So I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, 
for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard our hearts and our minds according to your will, Jesus. That whatever we be going through right now, Lord, would work together for your glory. And I pray that miracles will happen in Jesus' name. And I pray in Jesus' name that healing would take place. And I pray, Father, that you give us the strength to endure till Sunday comes. And Easter is a reminder that you have the last word. And the devil may win for a season. And our enemies may laugh for a moment. But the Lord will have victory for a lifetime. And you have the final say, Lord. So in Jesus' name, we walk this church right now. We leave with peace, knowing you're in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Come on, give him some praise this morning.